I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. Our guest tonight is Fred Clark, a progressive evangelical Christian blogger better known as Slacktivist. He's one of those Christians who defies all the stereotypes atheists tend to have of Christians. He's for gay marriage, he's critical of church leaders, and he's constantly frustrated with what his quote-unquote tribe does in the name of Jesus. Full disclosure, Fred writes for Patheos, the same network on which you can find my friendly atheist blog. Fred, thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Good. Did did I get all that right in the introduction there? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I I sign at the bottom of that. Sure. Great. So, Fred, uh, let's talk about the name Slacktivist. I really like it. What's the origin of that name? Uh, the origin of that um, back in the nineties, my friend Dwight and I were doing seminars at Cornerstone Music Festival, which is uh, was a really kind of cool, hippie, weird music festival, Christian evangelical music festival run by the Jesus People USA. Our type uh, of people. Uh, kind of, <laughs> uh, like, like the uh, hippie commune in Chicago. Yeah. And, That's uh, actually right next to my we, apartment. We went out there every nice. summer. You, you know them? Or? They they have like a skate shop right down the street from my apartment in Uptown. It's very strange. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you know where I live now. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're uh, they're an odd bunch. Yeah, but, the uh, Christian skater group. Um, but the the festival was just a great party every summer, and Dwayne and I did seminars out there, and one year we were doing it on kind of in reaction to, uh, at the time, it was the early 90s, and people were writing all the same stuff about Generation X then that they're writing about millennials now, you know. Um, it's always old people complaining days. about the young people, basically. Kids these days. It's yeah. the same thing. I, I'm really trying to resist ever turning into <laughs> the old person who writes that article. Um <laughs> But I guess at some point it just happens. It's like hair in your nose. It just comes with old age. Um, but but we were tired of that, and we were tired of the way the word slacker was being used all the time because of the Richard Linklater movie. But it made all of the elders just sound to us like the, the vice principal from Back to the Future, you know? <laughs> You're a slacker, McFly. <laughs> and... So we decided we would focus on the kind of activism that young people were doing, which there was some really exciting stuff being done by these supposedly apathetic Gen Xers. And we called it slacker activism. And uh, at some point, Dwight shortened that to slacktivism, which I said sounded terribly cheesy. It was an awful (laughs) word. And catchy. Uh, But uh, I, I've since come around to thinking, hey, it's actually kind of a cool word. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyone who so reads that, that's, anyone who reads your website may be surprised because a lot of the things that you write about evangelical Christianity, about the culture wars, about church-state separation, um, you know, I, I obviously read a lot of atheist blogs and write a, a lot of it myself. I don't think people, if they just saw your writing on paper. Um, they would think probably that you're an atheist yourself yeah. because a lot of the perspectives you take, a lot of the views you have seem to fall in line with what usually a lot of atheists online tend to say. Um, do you get that reaction a lot? Like, are you really a Christian or are you just an <laughs> atheist in disguise on a Christian blog portal? I I do get that a lot, not usually as a compliment, <laughs> more usually as an accusation. Um but I, I think part of it just comes from um, I'm I'm from a Baptist background, and you know, the separation of church and state is kind of a doctrinal issue for Baptists. Not that Baptists insist on any doctrinal issues. Baptists yeah. are sort of organized around the principle of not being organized. You know, we're yeah. not allowed to tell each other what to 
what to believe. Uh, but because, of, you know, from a Baptist point of view, um, I, I read a lot of atheist blogs and what is written there on separation of church and state. And uh, to me, it's a great way of keeping up on stuff um, because, you know, there's only one Baptist Joint Committee writing about those issues, but I find so much more. And yes, when when someone uh, teaches the Bible in schools or puts up a sectarian monument with taxpayer money on mm -hmm. public property, that's that's offensive to me. Um, and just to just to bring up one point that you just mentioned, there is, and I believe it's called the Baptist Joint Committee, and they're awesome about church-state separation. Though I, I don't hear about them in the news very often, but that's not to be confused with some of the big Southern Baptist names that we tend to hear, mm -hmm. who seem to want every sort of merging of church and state uh, that you could think of, as long as it's their church. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think the Southern Baptists are eventually going to just have a pope. <laughs> and you know they're they're increasingly unbaptist in their polity. Um, again, it, it, it's very unbaptist to call someone an unbaptist Baptist, but um, <laughs> so so I don't want to end up going there. But but the Baptist Joint Committee is called the Joint Committee because it is sponsored by a bunch of different Baptist associations, including. Back in the day, what used to be called the Northern Baptists, which are now just the American Baptists. And it used to be sponsored jointly by the Southern Baptists as well. But when the conservative takeover of the Southern Baptists happened, they stopped um, sponsoring that. Partly because the conservative takeover of Southern Baptists isn't really a fan of separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. how, how big is the... Uh, I don't want to. I don't know if "tribe" is the right word, but how big is the percentage, maybe, of people who tend to agree with you on these issues of church-state separation? I know, coming from an atheist perspective, when I write about this stuff, it seems very rare mm -hmm. to have Christians who say, "Yeah, I mean, you're wrong about the God thing, but I agree with you on the separation of church and state thing." I I wish more of them said that, and I very rarely find those voices. I rarely hear them in my comments. Um, you're one of the handful of people yeah, it, who seems to take that approach. Why is that? It is rare. Um, uh, although, you know, when I, I for a while, I, I was an intern with the American Baptist denomination right out of college. And I went to uh, the big Baptist biennial, which is their big every other year gathering. And they had one of these denominational fights over homosexuality at the time. And there were a lot of very conservative Baptist people there who thought, you know, wh what you would expect every very conservative person to believe about that. But because they were Baptist, they had, uh, they would add, you know, but I can't impose my religious view on other people. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems so like a very novel approach. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, unfortunately, it does, um, and it's a it's a sort of dying out understanding of what it means to be Baptist. I think, I, you know, it's it is odd. I, I think for a lot of people, it's just it's not really so much religion; it's just the hegemony of the culture they grew up in, and they're just used to it. You know, when that uh, when I worked at, at the Delaware newspaper, uh, the the one lower Delaware school district is just horrible. At, uh, you know, um, it's a big Christian school. That's the public school district. You know, that's how they think of it. So they just get upset when someone says, "Well, why are you praying before football games?" You know, yeah. um, and and it, I, I think when when the, they actually sort of drummed the Jewish family out of town hmm. when they tried to raise some of the stuff in court, um, 
they, I think they eventually won the case, but they moved out of town long before then because it was just intolerable, you know, to be living there anymore. But I, I think for a lot of people in that community, they, it just never occurred to them that someone thought differently than them. You and know? we still encounter that sort of mentality yeah. so many places today that you can't see beyond your own culture, beyond your own belief system. That seems to be where so much of this conflict comes from. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's particularly weird with the, the Ten Commandments business because, you know, there are so many different versions, sectarian differences in how do you number the Ten Commandments, how, which, how do you phrase them? You right. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there is very much a, an evangelical Protestant formulation of the Ten Commandments, and there's a Catholic formulation, and there are Lutheran forms, you know, and, and, you know, all these different groups say, well, oh, the Ten Commandments, who, who could object to that? Uh, you know, ignoring the first half of them is utterly sectarian. Right. Um, but, but it's, um, you know, just, just the process of choosing which Ten Commandments text you're going to publish means you're siding with one sect over against another sect. You know, so the, this idea that they're just generic Christian. Well, that never works. Yeah, I you know? I agree. That's kind of a really... Sh- I've always thought that was a short-sighted view of, like, people are trying to impose their religion into the schools or, or their local government, and I just feel like that's so short-sighted, especially if they're Baptist or some other, like, smaller sect of Christianity that, you know... What happens when everybody wants to do that? I don't... That's always been a... Well, that's the fun part. Like, as we're taping this anyway... Uh, like a school district in Florida said, oh, yeah, we'll allow a Bible giveaway from, yeah. like, I think, the Gideons. Not, I mean, and eventually they realized, oh, we have to open the door to all religious all groups them. and atheist groups. Mm-hmm. And as soon as the Satanists said, we want in, they were like, maybe we should stop this altogether. Yeah. It, they can't see past, like, oh, they think only Christians are going to do it. And right. that's why they think it's okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what entirely, you know, I, I don't know if there's, what what degree of sincerity or anything whether whether the satanism that's that's doing this stuff is more uh trying to prove a point than say <laughs> postarianism right but because i mean the name lucian greaves that's great i wish i had written that name <laughs> you know um but the stunts they're doing are just fantastic at highlighting yeah. The hypocrisies and the dissonances of these things, you know, and that's that's something I've tried to. It's always tricky because um, when you're arguing against state-sponsored prayer in schools, and you know, I I sometimes want to say, well, what if, you know, what if there's a Muslim teacher who wants to lead the class in an Islamic prayer, um, which is a hard thing, you know, to that will make most of the people who support prayer school recoil and horror at the thought. Right. But I don't want to uh, feed into an anti-Muslim thing there just to right. make that point. Um, Sometimes but, I wonder when I hear but, these counter offers, not just Christianity in the schools or whatever, like, yes, the Satanists, I think, are proving a good point, regardless of how sincere they may or they may not be. I feel like, and here's a debate worth having or something, um, what would be more effective, like a Satanist group coming in and saying, we want to do this, an atheist group coming in saying, we want to do this too, or having a Christian say, you know, I agree with the other Christians when it comes to the theology, but I disagree with them about what they are trying to do here and here's why. And I, I feel like that voice would be far more effective than the outsider minority disliked group coming in and saying, we just want to do what all of you are doing. Um, that has been effective at times, but I wonder if the Christian voice saying this is wrong, what we're trying to do here, I wonder if that would be even more yeah. effective. Because you you almost never hear that voice when it comes to these debates. Mm-hmm. I, I think both appeal to different ways of, of hearing or get around defenses in different ways. Yeah. You know, there's a defense when, when you raise the church-state separation issue, there's a defense against it that just says, we don't have to listen to these people that are atheists. <laughs> They're them, you know. Um, 
and that's one kind of way of shutting you out. Um, but then I think, like, with with that video response you just did for the Nines conference... Yeah, yeah. I, uh, um, I was asked for an evangelical Christian conference. They asked me if I wanted to make a video where I talk about my views on same-sex marriage, which surprised me at first, but I'm like... I'll say yes to this. Yeah. Here's my video. And they they lived up to what they said they were going to do. I mean, they played it as part... It was an online conference. They included it in their live stream. And uh, you know what the response I got from a lot of evangelicals who saw it as part... I don't know whether they were at church or they saw it at their in their basement or something... It was overwhelmingly positive, which was nice to see. Did they chop it together so you're like, I love <laughs> Jesus? <laughs> I feel like they could have done that if they wanted to, but they were they were very good about <laughs> letting me say whatever I wanted. I think the only restriction they said is, please don't swear up a storm, some version of that. And otherwise, they were like, say whatever you want. If anyone's a video editor, please, <laughs> please find that video and I, chop it together I, for I, me. I, I think they, they, I was impressed they asked. You know, I was too. And, and yeah. um, you know, I'm sure that eventually, you know, someday, years from now, God forbid, uh, when you do die, that they will circulate stories that you had a deathbed conversion just before then. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, I was impressed that they, they invited you to do it. But I think I think what you said in that um, will be heard. They're, they're probably more receptive to that coming from you than they would have been coming from somebody like me or say really? Michael Held Evans or someone. Because I think I think if if say Rachel had given much that same message, yeah. hey, you're losing young people to this. Yeah. Um the the filter that would be put on for that is she's not really one of us. I, I actually she's that's us, funny. She's not really one of us. So there'd be a suspicion kept mm-hmm. on her, whereas when you come in and say, Hi I'm not one of you. And here's what I think. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I think that that let them let some of that guard down. So I think what you said, I think you you said it in a way that will be heard. That's interesting. I now, actually again, had you the weren't, opposite. You weren't... I actually had the opposite thought when I when I made that, which is that I'm glad they're letting me say this. I mean, I'll here's what I have to say about it. I actually at first thought it would be more effective if it would come from someone like you or Rachel Held Evans, where, you know, you are part of the tribe, but you're saying they wouldn't even, that you guys wouldn't even be seen as part of the tribe, so it's easier to dismiss. Yeah, or, or I mean, one, you know, that's tribal language is a critique I make all the time, but because I, I think it explains a lot. Um, you know, one of the ways that, Tribes reinforce themselves is by policing that boundary. Yeah. Whereas you're just not. You're. I not, don't care. There's, there's no <laughs> role for the tribal gatekeepers in evaluating you. Cause right. What are you going right to do? Kick me the, out of church? I dare you. <laughs> right. <laughs> it says it right there on the tin. This is the friendly atheist. So you you you're not. Um, you know, the, it, it's sort of uh, like the invincible ignorance from from the Inquisition. You know. <laughs> uh, if you were uh, a pagan, you couldn't be a heretic. So the Inquisition oh. didn't have. Uh, it, it's sort of that that dynamic. Because you didn't leave Although, anything. Um, uh, right. So you couldn't be uh, in theological error. You were just right. in darkness. And, right. You know. You were. I mean, you were going to hell, but you right. weren't a heretic. <laughs> but at least I'm not going to be burned um, beforehand. Right. We didn't have to burn you with a stake and send you to hell. We just <laughs> You're welcome, by the way. Thank you. Your, your <laughs> eternal fate. Yeah, and I mean, there is a difference there between the way I would have uh, brought that message to them the way you did, which is that you are you were not just sarcastically celebrating. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, in the video, I basically said, thank people. you, thank you I mean, for the you way were... you've handled gay people, because it makes my job as an atheist a lot easier. That was the <laughs> gist of what the video said. Yeah, yeah. and and I mean, you were, you um, were wry about it, but you weren't kidding about that. That's Oh, no, I'm totally true. serious. Like, <laughs> I mean, we've made and, this point before and... that the way the church has handled the issue of homosexuality mm-hmm. has done more for atheism than pretty much anything Richard Dawkins has done, Bill Maher has done, any of those people. Actually, Fred, that brings yeah, me to a right question. Yeah, there with Ken Ham, I think. Yeah. yeah. In terms of... 
Ken Ham them? sends a lot of people well, our Ken way. Ken Ham is just an atheist manufacturing machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should send him that like efficient. little button for Christmas. Oh, mm-hmm. I love that. He, he is an assembly line of of. Uh, I mean, yeah, I I don't know. <laughs> no one understands him either. It's all right. <laughs> Fred, actually, that you, kind of brings me to a question. By, by not using, you know, by cautioning against uh, excessive profanity. So I, I'm <laughs> withdrawing from you. Oh, you can swear subject. if you want. We're all friends here. <laughs> Avoid the temptation. <laughs> So, Fred, I've been curious, and I've asked a couple of people on this show before, What, why did Christianity at large, especially in the U.S., why have they decided that the homosexuality thing is where they're going to plant their flag? Like, what, like, of why all Why is the, that the big issue? Right, like, of all the things in the Bible, like, anybody who, you know, has a cursory knowledge will point to the shellfish thing, and then you're not supposed to wear what Two types of fabrics. fibers or yeah. whatever. Like, yeah. and that's all in the same chunk of the Bible. So what is it, like, why, why the homosexuality thing? Like, why, do you know why, why that's, like, the flag they plant there? Why not say the prohibition against usury? Right. Yes. Say, yeah, which, which, um, I mean, one of the things I, I sometimes argue is, hey, I'm not really asking you to interpret the Bible any differently. I'm just asking you to read the parts on sex the way you now read the parts on money. Yeah. Is what I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. um, but why why this issue? One is uh part of part of the answer is it is it has become the substitute for the whole question of the authority of the Bible. You know, um it's a shorthand reference for how do you read the Bible in the same way that the young artist creation is used for a lot of people. Mm. Um, it's not that they're particularly hung up on the age of the earth or something, but they, it's a, it's a symbol of a whole host of ways that you approach the Bible. Mm-hmm. Is it a plain literal meaning? And do you consider that, you know, the word of God? Um, and so for, for it, it's become this flashpoint because that's, that's what it represents. It represents this whole other question of what does the Bible mean? How can, you know, um, but then, but that still doesn't have to answer the question of why that point, right. why not any of these other things? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think it's a whole host of things. I think it's, you know the ick factor, the the ignorance, but I I think uh, a big chunk of it is probably that it's the one sin that was safe to preach against. That uh, if you're straight, mm-hmm. you're not gonna fall for you know, it. You're, yeah, exactly. Like it's you can something cheat that your wife, it's, you it's can... something that other people do. It's yeah. not something that you do per se. Exactly, and it's not like. You know, greed, lust, envy, wrath, pride. I, I, I'm tempted by all of those. <laughs> right. And I, if I, if I make those the thing, you know, then I might stumble on one of those and then get, you know, caught. But, um, but I don't like guys. Yeah. So if I, if I preach against that, it's perfectly safe. Except for um, the number of I priests think, uh, who were later found. <laughs> Who happen to like guys quite much? Or, yeah, quite and much? I, you know, yeah, sure. and, <laughs> yeah, it turns out some of the people who are most vocal against it do have a me thinks they don't protest too much. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. It, but, <laughs> Speaking well, of reasons um, to protest, though, let me bring this up. You've been doing like the longest book review in history, I think. <laughs> Because you began like a decade ago writing a review of all of the uh, uh, Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, I hope I got their names right, but all the Left Behind books, um, and you've been doing this, like every book, and you're only on book three right now. Wait, really? Because, oh yeah. I am halfway Be- through book three. Because you only do these reviews a page or two at a no, time. You I don't review the whole book, you review this page and what's wrong with this page, and you've been doing this forever. So, okay, so here's the question. You're halfway through book three. How long is this series going to go? Why that method? Um, and what do you, I mean, are you going to compile these? Because I feel that would be a more interesting book than yeah. the Left Behind books. I, well, it's actually, it's longer than. <laughs> it's longer than the whole series already? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's each review has been longer than than the books that it's covered. <laughs> um, yeah, I I am working on putting those together as an ebook or something. Excellent. Um, um, but it, I, you know, I went out. I I grew up in a fundamentalist church and a fundamentalist private school where we read Hal Lindsey's books as a textbook in my school. Oh. You know, I took tests. I took tests on this stuff. Uh, I, I studied those charts uh, for credit in, in high school. We just saw you the know, Nicolas um, Cage version of the Left Behind, the, the movie I, featuring... Did you see it? That, that it was, was two hours, and we can't take any more of it. And it you're so doing bad. these I for years it. and years. Oh, my God. But, but I, 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 I think it was better than the book. <laughs> because, That's, that is a sad. <laughs> that movie was so bad. <laughs> because from what I can tell, they they basically remade Airport Seven Seventy Five for yeah. the last half of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and um, you know, the 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 landing of the plane in the book itself uh-huh. uh, happens off screen. It it um. It's not even part the, of the series, the, really. That's like the a plot of the, the movie. The chapter yeah. ends. The one chapter ends with with Rayford saying it was going to be a tricky landing with the, the runway littered with with fallen planes. Um, and and then the next chapter begins with them having landed the plane. <laughs> um, that's disappointing. And he's basically going, "Phew, that was tough." So you're saying the movie uh, so didn't the, exactly go from the source material <laughs> as the movie much. The is an adaptation of a gripping action scene that was omitted in the book. <laughs> uh, 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 but then the next scene in the book is is our heroes walking across this tarmac covered with uh, crashed airplanes uh-huh. and, and the wounded and the dying and um, trying to figure out how they're going to Get back to um, the suburbs with with all the, the highways uh, closed, <laughs> and they're just they're just walking past these people, and it was seems like that hitting seeing something like that in print and just is just jaw droppingly bad that that made me you know I intended to buy the book <laughs> write a review based on the fact that I knew this Bible prophecy world pretty well. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't get past <laughs> the first some page of that stuff without. Um, and you know that's what blogging is. It's it's um, it's yelling at the TV mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and hoping someone else is watching you. Li- what reading you do that? Yes, it's random. You know, it, is. It's uh, some of us right from a place of joy or whatever. Others, uh, you know, we're we're <laughs> a place of frustration. TV. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of I've yeah, heard of movies I, that were badly adapted from the book. I've never heard of a movie that said it was based on the book, but it wasn't even based on something that happened really in the book. Well, I mean, the kind of did land uh, in the book. It's just we didn't get to see it. You don't get to see anything happen in the book. Really. You're telling me the for... daughter did not remove debris from the road using the a tractor part. that she found oh. on the side of the road. She knew how to move so no, much heavy in, machinery. In the book, <laughs> so good. In the book, the daughter's just at Stanford when the rapture happens, and then a day later, she shows up. Back in Illinois, so women are represented. Um, <laughs> Congratulations, Left Behind movie. Without any explanation as to how she got there, <laughs> while at the same time that's interspersed with the story of how hard it is for Buck to get from Chicago to New York because there are no planes flying and all transportation's been shut down, and so you, it's literally like interspersed with how impossible it, it is to get around. So so really, we could make any movie. We could make any movie we want to, Mm -hmm, and say it's based off of Left Behind. I think because we'll just say it was in the part that was omitted from the book. (laughs) Well, and so much Chloe's trip from California, Illinois, must be epic, but we don't know what happened. Yeah, some of it is is also just. I mean, I don't care if you're a, a. pre-millennial dispensationalist Sunday or or an atheist or you know what your perspective on life is, you ought to be able to get something 
I mean, that whole mythology, that whole uh, 20th century fundy end times mythology stuff. I mean, I gave us the omen. You know, that's a pretty good story. You, yeah. you can, you can, it, you, it ought to be exciting. Certainly the end of the world ought to be exciting. Uh, there's, there's, you know, demon locusts with heads of lions and stuff. That, that <laughs> ought to, that ought to, you know. What's worse, the plot or the writing? It's, the, the thing about these books that, that has kept me going is, I mean, they, they fail on every level. It's, <laughs> the theology's bad. The writing's bad. They are more deathly misogynist than I expected. That's impressive. Um, they're just, it's like everything. Is it sad like, that like they have sold more of those books than anything any one of us will ever write? Hey, I haven't written my book yet, so let's take it easy. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. It, well, I think it's, it's... Left Behind is like jazz. It's again, all about the, the pages whole, you don't <laughs> write. <laughs> uh, but, but I think it's partly because the audience, it's a captive audience. You know, in, in 1995, when that first one came out, there wasn't a lot of fiction that those people yeah. were allowed to read. A captive those audience in more ways them. than one. Oh. Well, those yeah. poor saps don't and, have Harry Potter to um, read, yeah. so what are they going to do with their life? <laughs> it's a shame. Yeah, I I don't get to not allowed Harry Potter. We were allowed um, Narnia, you know? Yeah. That's pretty Christian, though. And and that's got magic and wands and Yeah, but Jesus is a lion. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's a clumsy allegory, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's still got all that magic stuff. So, so it's Harry Potter once you yeah. get the book seven. Yeah. Right. yeah. Spoil that. Okay. You nope. can Spoilers. It it's okay. Spoilers for Harry Potter, guys. <laughs> no, actually, I grew up reading the um, the Narnia, Narnia series, and I did not get the Christian themes until I was yeah. like much older than I should have been. Like, I was in college, and I was like, oh, oh, gee, okay, I get it. That's what that was <laughs> there about. There it is. It clicked. <laughs> I was a the dumb kid, I guess. It's really, um, it's very much, you know, just your basic sort of Christ story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From a particular view of the atonement or whatever. But still, that's that's very straightforward. But the, the second book in the series is um, really kind of a tract against Christian legalism. Because um, and I, I think a big chunk of Prince Caspian is C.S. Lewis thumbing his nose at. American Christians, because mm. evangelicals love C.S. Lewis. He did not. But it was it's an unrequited love. He, <laughs> um, they bothered him because you know they didn't drink beer, among <laughs> other things, and um, he he did quite a bit. Mm. And uh, yeah, and the whole second book of the Narnia thing is, is all about uh, these. Um, you know, these strict people who come in and chase away all the wild things and outlaw all the, you know, wild, true Narnia that has to... I mean, at the end of the book, uh, Bacchus is the first wild thing to return, and it tears down the bridges with uh, vines <laughs> to grow grapes to make wine. <laughs> Attaboy. So, there um, you go. We'd be so I was reading that in my funny school, thinking, did I say read this? <laughs> Do you know what's in here? <laughs> uh, but I don't think they did either. I think they just gave us permission because it was C.S. Lewis and therefore, you know, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, things like that got me through uh, quite a bit. Let me ask you, as a critic of a lot of this stuff, as a critic of the church, do you see it changing from the inside at all? Well, you know, yes. Um, but also it's just, it's, there's so many different strains and strands and flavors and, uh, traditions, um, that, that, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, so sometimes it's hard to tell whether, oh, is this a change in the church or have I just wandered over into a different part, you know? <laughs> Um, uh, it seems like an awful lot of the former evangelicals, uh, at least the ones who write online, 
are are Episcopalian now. Yeah. Um, I'm not Episcopalian. I'm just uh, an expatriate in, <laughs> in the Episcopal Church. Um, we have a couple. We have a couple last questions for you. One of them is just uh, what do you, what impact at some point? I'm sure in the near future. Uh, same-sex marriage will be legal across the nation. I mean, I feel like that's going to happen sooner rather than later. What effect is that going to have on the church that maybe we're not seeing right now? Um, yeah. Uh, will well, anything? I, I mean, less, I think a lot of uh, people are going to, you know, um, come out, you know, Dave Jeshi just wrote a book in what 2014 endorsing uh, same-sex marriage, and it's getting denounced right now. I think 30 years from now, some of the people who are denouncing it now are going to point back to it and say, "Well, look, no, we were we were approving of this." Mm. Uh, Christian voices, you know, it, it'll be like there were some fantastic. Christian abolitionists, yeah, in in the antebellum U.S., some some really amazing people, just just um, heroes. Um, but they were a minority of the church, right? And a minority of white America. Uh, and yet, when the church or white America looks back to that period, you know, we're always with. With Casas and not with Columbus, we're always with John Woolman and not with John Calhoun. Yeah, you know, um, this is so one I of my think, big fears of what's going to happen, which is that the church is going to say, "Hey, gay marriage is legalized. We made this happen." No, they're they're not going to ever admit <laughs> that they were the obstacle for it happening. They're going to say, "Yeah, we're the re-, you know we finally began embracing it, and then it, we pushed it over the finish line." They're going to find a way to take credit for this at some point in the future. Mm. I mean, I it's feel It's going like to happen. It's going to happen. In our lifetime? In our lifetime, they will start taking credit for the push for gay marriage assholes. somehow. Well, I don't know how fast, <laughs> but I'm cynical enough to say yes, eventually. But I, I, I'm with Jeff on, on in our lifetime, maybe, maybe not quite our lifetime. Eventually. But down then. the road. Yeah. But do you think, like, historically, they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, we came around. So, like, in textbooks 100 years, they're not going to have textbooks. And whatever they use 100 <laughs> years from now, is that, you think, in our lifetime? Uh, well, 100 years from now, you'll you'll be able to read, like, Southern Baptist writings talking about, you know, Bishop Gene Robinson as though he were a Southern Baptist and not someone they had nullified for decades um, right, uh, they're going to start embracing the, uh, all these pastors that are like, oh yeah, gay marriage is great, and they are, they're heretics right now, but they're going to love them later. But here's the thing, is we have a record, like for the first time in history, yeah. we have a record for every shitty thing. <laughs> we like, have all Christians the video have... of Jerry Falwell, we right. have videos like, of Like there's Robert no Taylor. hiding from that. Like yes, you can whitewash it as much as you can, but there's no hiding from it. We have records. That's like if I pr- came out as a Christian and it was like, oh, I was never an atheist. They've got hundreds <laughs> of blog posts I read. They're like, are you Sure. Do you want to do you want to check that over? You know, I don't know. It's it's there, but it's it's uh well the other the other interesting question uh, ramifications of that change is what happens to the the current insistence that that those dozen not even a dozen those six or seven Bible verses that are right now the crux of Christianity. You know, the clobber verses. Um, yeah, what happens to the fact that right now we're saying they must, and obviously, and can only be interpreted in this way, mm-hmm. uh, in 30 years when we're all reading them that way, what will we make of that? And that's what really mystifies me, because um, you know, and this is one of the things I've been reading a lot about is is Mark Knoll's work on the Civil War and and some other uh, Carolyn Dupont's stuff on the Civil Rights Movement. And you see these these um, theological disputes. You know, what does the Bible say about slavery? Well, that that fight, that argument, never got settled. You know, it got settled by other means. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when we look back on it, we all agree with 
the abolitionist interpretation, but none of their arguments won. And um, a lot of revisionist the, the history the clobber, coming up. The clobber text for slavery just disappeared. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, um, if we read them the way we read these verses on homosexuality, we would have to say, hey, we're wrong to get rid of slavery. Mm-hmm. Or some such. Um, uh, and eventually, hopefully, we will come to... I mean, uh, there was a counter-argument, of course, that says, no, 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 look, there is this stuff in the Bible, here's another way of looking at it. But that argument never won. But one was General Grant. Right. You know? And uh, I don't know what will happen to the clobber text in 20 years. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Fred, this is a lot of fun, but we have to wrap up. Um, we can find you where? Uh, I am at the Slacktivist on, on Patios. We will provide a link uh, to... along with this. Mm-hmm. Cool. And and um, where can I direct people to find that? Um, That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> once we figure out a home for this podcast, <laughs> we're, we're going to let you know. Um, <laughs> it's one of the many things on a list of things we really should have done about three months ago. Well, I don't know. We're nailing this. Yeah, we're, we're nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Fred Clark, he's Sorry, a Slacktivist Fred. on the Patheos Network, and we'll provide a link for that. Fred, thanks so much for your time. Always fun talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Thanks. It was, it was fun. Thanks very much for having me. Take care. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at patreon.com slash hemant, that's he man T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Bloomke. We hope you'll join us next time.